sabotage all projects from project. Yeah. <laughs> I like walking around because no one wants anything from me. No one has a question for me. I don't have to decide on anything. Usually if I walk down the hallway, someone's like, we've got to pick the colors for this room. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I just saw my very first playable thing. It was two pizza box men walking around on some grass. But it looked a little foggy. So I think it's Black Lake. <laughs> um, that looked cool. It's always fun to walk. I, the first time I saw someone actually holding a controller in their hand, I was walking down the hallway. So um, Black Lake uh, wins, pretty much. It's done. It's over. Um, you can smell the other ones that you hear. Uh -huh. The sight ones, obviously, are within one screen of each other. Right? It takes, you have to be within one screen of it to, to, to do. And then the, the sound ones, I'm thinking you'll be able to hear them two screens away. And the smell ones, you might be able to smell three screens away. And oh, so that's what okay. that's what I'm looking at. It's just potting mouth because screen sizes. because smell. In order to smell, you have to turn off your light. You have to be careful. You have to like really look at this thing. Okay. Whereas the sound's going to happen ambiently, anyways. That's anything about this? Like, I'm I'm just concerned that we won't be able to fill with enough stuff up to actually make it look like a forest. Is this? I mean, it sounds like it's pretty modular. So if we just need to like chop off a couple of areas at the end, we'll be able to to do that, right? Well, filling it up is the modular part. We're 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 building it in a really modular. way. Way. So um, I feel like uh, I, I trust these guys. I think they they can make it it look we can good. Fill it up. We can fill it up. Um, it, it's just going to mainly. I think the first point is going to be how many screens um, it needs to be for the for the feel. And coming into the forest, it's like there are uh, you know forest trees that you go into down here. So that's the very beginning of the game. And um, so the, the first you see a fox that um, is, is outside the forest, and um, you see it right at the edge of the trees, and it runs inside. I feel like um, the, the big thing is that spacing out the clues with enough screens in between that you have to, that the player needs to move, needs to explore, and needs to use their, their sense mode. And doesn't um, stumble And doesn't stum on. stumble into it, or can't stand in one place and then look out in all directions and go, oh, there's the next right. one. Right. And so it's almost like, like um, if if two visual clues are two two normal screens apart, then the furthest extent that you look in the pull out mode needs to not be two screens. It needs to be less than that. So like one point seven five or one and a half screens. I think two screens would be too much anyways. Yeah. So I, really, I yeah. 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 So, so do you guys like, just want to like pick one of those things and then we can place that mm -hmm. and then figure out how many screens you need yes. around it and then yeah. we yeah. can start figuring out how big the world should be. I want the gameplay to really like be like a, a route that is this way, and then um, the brambles and the fox and the dreams are really coming out from there. Um, we hide some fun stuff here and here. Yeah, these are pockets for uh, finding stuff, but um, really, like, this is nothing over here. This is, like, this is rocks. This is rocks just to direct you, you know? This is, like, this is, like, clue number one right here find some fur and then you get over here and it directs you out this way and clue number two is right here mm -hmm. um, it directs you this way and then clue number three is here and then points you over that okay. way because okay. hopefully it's not super so obvious that you're gonna follow the path perfectly you're gonna yeah. want to explore the environment and if we have like cool little uh, Easter eggs or the thing story bits that happen on the outside outskirts then you're yeah. gonna want to hit those um, let me just another color. so yeah this is basically what I'm gonna do except that I'm also gonna like just figure like out the, the distance between those things, oh, okay. and then yeah, you guys yeah. can figure out how to actually make that into an yeah. awesome environment. Yeah, um, <laughs> it feels like a. Can you actually maybe scan that, put that on the network so you can have a reference? You guys can have this. Oh, okay. We'll give it to him You want me to sign that? <laughs> it can be fake. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Maybe war. Twenty home. years from now, it's gonna sell it on eBay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Sweet. Good place to start. Okay. Perfect. Very cool. Awesome. Today was like a little bit of a relief with um, me thinking. Man, like I could skip a day of this, and people would. I, I can't really skip a day, but um, people, the the team could make this game. I've 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 given enough of what I think the game should be like um, that I feel like the thirteen people. What about thirteen, fourteen? It seems like a gang, man. Um, they they know they know the the vibe of it and and what what the end product is. And there's decisions to make along the way that will change it, but uh, I'm pretty pretty good on thinking that 
they know how to do it. Yeah, and then you guys, the camera stuff with Duncan? Yeah. I think he'll just get a feel for that. He'll probably be able to you know, pop out the numbers. Oh, yeah. Okay. This panel here. Mm -hmm. That's about what I was thinking. Okay. And honestly, the field of view on a first-person camera is mess it all up. It's going to mess it up. So we'll probably have to we'll probably have to tweak it a lot. Based okay. On that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. But you think it's looking all right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, we'll get it in there and, and tune it. That looks that looks right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I haven't, I haven't done any real modeling in a while, so it's good. <laughs> See, it's it. We're all doing stuff we don't normally do. Yeah. So it's good. Okay, sweet. Point. I'm actually I'm on track to get all of the heads done feel today and all the prototypes done. Yeah, that so uh, you might get an open mouth kiss. Just, just <laughs> warning you. Can I can I get a butt cup as well? <laughs> just of double. Course. Yeah. That's, that's when the, that's what all the parts are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's not jump in. Um, but uh, I think it would be it would be nice if um, by next week by Monday I could start cranking on like the, the final parts I guess um, that would be that would be awesome because because I, I think it, I can probably get our, our complete part list into the game by Friday in terms of just like basic some representation yeah, some representation of it. Um, and then we can spend yeah. the next week making it look awesome yeah um, Hey, Yo. sugar pie. Um, hey, are you? Uh, I just wanted to. I was just checking with Jeff. But sure. I wanted to make sure you were you still set going through all the parts, right? I'm, yeah, that's. Uh, I'm focusing on that now. I feel like a lot of this stuff is gonna. It's that there's some awesome phrase that I can't think of that like uh, the best laid plans when they meet the enemy are destroyed. Something, whatever. You've heard that one? Sounds very pretty good to me, Brad. It's pretty good. No, it's basically just like, I don't want to spend too much more time doing this because, and I feel like I can do a little bit of like, at least light lifting on the code side to like get stuff in faster. Yeah. And then we can um, kind of figure out like what the hell is, is going to work. And I think we're just going to really do it, just take a super iterative approach where we just have like, we're just going to get them like walking around. Yeah. Like cool. And then we'll get them responding to movement and then we'll get them, you know, just, we're just going to build Build, build it slowly. Uh, that's about it. Oh yeah, we were so we're designing the um, the primitives is what we're calling them for autonomous, and these are going to be the individual parts that you find like all over the um, all over the world. This sort of like junkyard Tron kind of looking looking world, um, and so they're going to be leg parts and torso parts and arm parts and head parts. And you're gonna put those together into one of these automatons, and then you're gonna jam this like big. It's gonna be like a big, like almost like old school Atari cartridge. You're gonna like jam it in its back, and that's how you're gonna bring it to life. Um, and then they're gonna sit there for a few seconds, and then kind of activate, and then like start doing whatever the programming is. Uh, so yeah, we were just talking about how um, we're sort of like setting up the the design space of like all the different variables that the the automatons will have so that we can make parts that sort of like stress different strengths and weaknesses of that design space. So basically we're trying to c construct this thing where there's a lot of like emergent overlapping design space, nerd, like nerd stuff. Yep. I did come up with like a low power, low energy cost, uh, high HP tank chassis that has no arm slots. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah, know if that's interesting fire. or not, like but you, you use it as like a decoy or like mm -hmm. a like a shield. You could you could ride on it. It would probably be really good to like ride into a heavy fire zone and then jump off and then send your other dudes in. Could be cool. Like I like that. Um, yeah, the like because this other one, the the like ultra heavy one, is like four arm slots, high HP, but it's like gonna eat most of your energy to actually power that guy up. Yeah. And if he blows up, you're probably boned. Um, but like, I don't know, a lot of this stuff is the stuff that's like, ah, it sounds pretty cool. Like, get in the game and be like, uh, maybe it's terrible. If you're like a design nerd, like I am, you look at this and you get really excited and you see all these numbers and you see all these like, these colors and you're like, you know, you're just trying to find, trying to make sure that you have like the most interesting things uh, possible given the like sets of constraints and the, the tuning variables that you have. And yeah, and then uh, a lot of times I, I find when you start doing this, this is sort of like a, um, it's like numberless design. You're just trying to be like, oh, well, this thing will have a lot of hit points and this thing will have a very low amount of hit points. It's like you don't really know what those numbers are and it doesn't matter right now. It's just more about like finding those, like like something, you know, just finding interesting points in the like 
design height field or something? I don't know. This, is, this doesn't even make any sense. Like, I still think that game design is like a really weird, squishy, sort of whatever pseudo science thing that nobody understands. So I think just like playing a lot of games and critically thinking about games, you can develop like a really good design sense, and then you don't really need to go to school for it. Don't tell that. Don't tell that to everybody. Don't 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 put that out there in the world. That would be that would be the worst. Don't tell them. Yeah, go to school. <laughs> go to school. Get some real skills. Sure. Um, oh, and then I d yeah, I did some coding. I did some coding. Well, Checked in some stuff. Oh yeah, a bunch of pound defines. Look out. I could do that. No, this. Is, that. <laughs> I did. I did real code. Look at this. Look oh, yeah, at this look stuff. There's a there's That's a loop. I did. I, I did all this. Dip. Look at all these enums. Yeah. I, I, Enum serialization. I saw. I saw, some... I saw you checking, and there's a bunch of enums. I almost made a joke. I appreciate all of the work. I'm gonna write some real code <laughs> soon. All right. And then you'll be. Really if I can't sorry. read it, then you'll be code. really sorry. <laughs> you'll be really sorry with real code guns. <laughs> Uh, so, are there other uh, items? I know you've talked about the the cord too. Yeah, the cord is probably the most like um, it, it'll be the most like fun from a minute to minute standpoint because mm -hmm. like the hook shot is super cool. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Um, and the way that that works is that um, you, you just you can run around, you can fire it. It goes in a straight line. It goes a specific distance. Um, if it hits something that has a port, uh, then uh, the game pauses and an interface comes up where you can look at the data for that object. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, you know it'll be all kinds of stuff, right? Like you know we'll probably just expose everything through there that like um, the game uses for like scale and speed and all that kind of stuff and uh, you know it'll be fun to manipulate those and like change the behavior of the monsters and that kind of thing from the from the data sweet and it'll be kind of a cool item too because like it'll still be restrictive right like it'll give you a lot of control over anything that you can hit but you know just by virtue of the way that we design the levels like maybe there are guards and orientations mm -hmm. where they're like protected by walls so you can't actually hit them normally mm -hmm. and uh, so we'll still have it, like that's one of those tools that we can introduce early and it's like interesting and powerful but uh, we still can like think carefully about the design of the level so that it's not all powerful and allows you to break mm -hmm. every aspect of the game. Uh, ultimately it's still uh, like a, a Zelda weapon or something in that like as soon as you hit it like technically you have the guy dead but then it's like you can kill him in multiple ways. You could like make him small, you could make him really slow so you can just run around him, yeah. you can put him to sleep, like you'll be able to control all of those kind of attributes. Mm -hmm. So it's like you still have the like action based gameplay of just like I need to attach this to somebody, but then as soon as you do you get to like choose what you do to like exactly get rid of them. I'm sure you have a lot to do. How are you getting all this done in two weeks? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We need to get a, a specific okay. list of possible okay. animations for these guys, yes. other than walks, because yeah. so we have walks. That's all we have right yeah. now, so and yeah. we're gonna need more than just walks. Yep. So yeah, yeah, and that will Probably kind of like determine the animation pipeline once we figure out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we'll need like some sort of interact. Yeah, like a generic like interact with a machine or something, and then probably also like a talk. You know, yeah. like when people, when because you know, interacting with stuff in the world and socializing are like the two obvious things that we can probably do a generic one for that will cover all of our cases. Hopefully, I don't know. I, I I can just imagine like a generic interact. You know, that's only like a few frames, like working for a huge majority. Like when scientists are doing science, it does this. You know, I'll talk with Anna a bit about the the AI and animation. Um, I'm just like um, coming up with some AI for what they're gonna do. I'm just trying to wrap my head around like everything we want to be able to do given the design. Yeah, we're trying to do a little bit of people simulation, social simulation. Not that games, that, you know, there's been plenty of games that have done that, but um, I think that's where a lot of our ambitions lie. And really, it's just going to be a matter of like, you know, how how do we how do we get there? Because usually, you know, AI in big game development is the sort of thing that you have to build a huge infrastructure to be able to, you know, and you have to use like sort of these formalized ways of doing stuff. Um, and, you know, we're doing like the quick and dirty hacky version of that. Uh, we kind of narrowed it down to just a couple to start with. Like for instance, whether you're injured or dead, and then there's your morale, which is like, which is a number. And it's just like, it's basically how well you're feeling. Like if you're going through, through your day and 
it's everything is exactly as like you wanted it, exactly how you wanted it to go like for instance you're not there's no disasters there's like you know you're able to do your job exactly at the time that it was scheduled um, there are no setbacks like you haven't had any bad social interactions and stuff your morale is going to be recovering or staying really high anything destabilizing like you know you screwed up your job or like you're someone else did and the fire started and you got burned or something like that you know there, there are various events that can lower your morale um, and that uh, morale in turn affects how well you do your job so if your mor morale is really really low you might screw up and if you're an engineer in a power station it might start a fire which might affect other sims you know what I mean um, and here I think yeah we just need to pay attention to like we need to use like knowing that we will not be able to, to, to implement a lot of rules we need to choose those rules and shape them in a way that produces maximum interesting interactions intersections of those rules uh, for the for the for the amount of effort that we're doing so yeah you're directly in charge of all the features you've ever wanted in a game like that. And since I played those games a lot, like I have some ideas about what, what I'd like to see. So I really get out, uh, I get a lot out of building something in the game and then watching The Sims actually use it and like, you know, have it affect gameplay. Like that's the thing I'm most excited about. Just having my actions um, get interpreted by this artificial life. Like that's what I yeah, really love, and like the stories that you can kind of infer from that. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, that all sounds great, and cool. uh, yeah, I want to see what they and uh, reply to some, some emails and stuff. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm good. I think we've done pretty good today, actually. Uh, we're still pulling pieces together from other branches and other pieces of tech, but uh, it seems to be coming together. Um, a lot of the design ideas, I guess, were a little bit vague, so it's not really been so much about adapting, just about picking, picking out something that's going to work and just rolling with it. It's more of a um, opportunistic way of doing things. I didn't really have a super detailed plan for how the the step by step design was going to work. It was just more an overall feel and style. Um, so it's been it's been pretty good. Dave and I have sat down and done some. Uh, uh, decent discussions about how things might work and he suggested we break it down into three sort of stages and I think that helped us a lot so um, we, we just tackled each one separately and it wasn't like trying to design a whole game's worth of stuff so so far so good. So basically the character comes up to this crane and you can jump across and from here we'll design it so they pretty much you either succeed and you'll hit the spot every time or if you try to jump you'll fail you won't make the jump basically what we were doing was we were sort of blocking out the like the metrics of each puzzle um, like usually towards the end of the night I'll kind of like noodle around in Maya and like sort of just try to come up with like a puzzle like by moving objects around like maybe I'll set some like keyframes on like some blocks moving around and then I'll be like oh look if that block does this and then you do like that moves this way I'll sort of figure out how to make a puzzle like on the fly like that so yeah if you write it all the way when it opens you'll kind of end up right back where you're started you're mm -hmm. like great here I am like I just got nowhere but if you jump right here while it's opening and ledge grab just regular old ledge grab you can pull up and then you can proceed forward so getting the platforming to work on like one hand is like it takes a long time to get platforming animations and gameplay stuff to feel really smooth um, we're lucky because we all kind of worked on the cave together so and in that game we were like we want the player to not notice jumping but we want them to just jump um, so we have that to pull from like a lot of those animations are going to translate like kind of directly over to uh, this game only they're going to be less comical and more more serious like our other characters in the cave are all like whoop -a -doop -a -doop. yeah as long as we like just like take into account all the different blends to different states but it seems pretty simple here so yeah hopefully like hopefully i think it, i think it'll blend pretty good i mean like Worst case scenario is like, you know, she's dangling and looping like this and like, you know, her like, like jump forward is like, there'll be a tiny pop, but I don't think that it's like... But Dave, like, what are like the failure cases on it? Like, if you're doing that hand over hand on the bottom, can you just drop and die at that point? Like, or do we like, 
you're safe. If we if we have the time to add like her releasing and dropping and adding that thing, yeah, like, we'll have to smoke and mirrors that in the animation. So it's like, yeah, well, look, it, that's happening. It seems like the way we're doing it is is your player control is going to be pretty confined. Like, pretty much you're going to be yeah. able to like jump it to another cutscene. Yeah, but don't but tell the documentary that. Don't tell that. The, the players won't notice that. <laughs> yeah, we're that we're gonna magic <laughs> show this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're. As, as you're playing it, you're gonna think, you're gonna feel like you're playing like free to control, but we like free to control regular gameplay. But we want it to be kind of like Shadow of the Colossus, where it's like you're climbing up on this big giant crazy creature. And so we're gonna do a bunch of little tricks to sort of fake that feeling, so it looks or feels like you're climbing up this like giant creature, but really we're able to make that happen in two weeks. You know, because that's normally that would be something really difficult to do, take a lot of time, so it's mostly just about smoke and mirrors at this point of making you think that you're like riding this big balancing board and like it's, you know, like this girl is like about to fall off and then huge things come crashing down and uh, hopefully we can like cut to like, you know, close-ups of the character like right before something happens and then cut away. Like I was saying earlier about how editing, you don't even notice it when it's really good and like hopefully we can have little, little cuts like that in the game and like sort of just make it just really cinematic but really like feel like you're not in cutscenes not you know like it's just continue to that ever that never ending quest that all of us do to squish gameplay and cutscenes together to one day pull it off one day make it work right like a never ending quest for us that's our puzzle is solving that problem